This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. We'll now go on to introduce associates. Uh, we've seen previously already how we have control over a subsidiary. Uh, remember, control is the power to direct, isn't it? Uh, and that's whereby we, we tend to own greater than 50% of those voting shares. So 50% of the equity share capital and if we own greater than 50 percent we can pass an ordinary resolution and appoint the directors if we appoint the directors then we are going to appoint our directors to run the subsidiary and therefore we control those directors and control the subsidiary however it may not be that we own greater than 50 percent it could very well be that we own anywhere between 20 and 50 percent of a business if we own between 20 and 50% of a business, then that is deemed that we have significant influence over the entity. Now, that's different from control. Okay, Control is the power to direct the activities, isn't it? Influence is that you have the power to participate. So you don't control the entity, so you can't appoint the directors, but maybe you have a few directors on board with your 20 to 50 percent and they can be like a little bit of an irritant. Uh, they can make themselves heard. So if you have the power to participate, you can make yourself heard at the board meetings. And if you can make yourself heard at the board meetings, then maybe you have that little bit of influence. The issue that we have is then how to go through and establish how or if we have influence and then once we've established that we have influence how do we go through there and go through and account for that influence so the normal assumption that we have is that if we own between 20 and 50 percent of an entity then that is assumed that we have influence over that business uh, however let's just say you own i don't know 19.9 percent of that business so it's not 20. So by definition, that's not necessarily having influence. However, if you have any of the following, then maybe that might go through there and give you evidence of influence, even though you own, say, 19.9%, so a bit less than 20. So it's not set in stone that it has to be between 20 and 50. Uh, it could be slightly less than 20 but influence is exerted in other ways. So what you have there is maybe you have representation on the board of directors. So maybe if you have, say, one of the four directors or one of the five or two of the five directors, we, we don't have control because we can't pass enough votes uh, to pass an ordinary resolution. But we, we do have influence, don't we, with that one out of four or two out of five or one out of three directors. Uh, if you're able to demonstrate that you're investment has allowed you participation in the policy making process and that will go through there and also demonstrate that you have significant influence uh, if there have been material transactions between yourself and the entity uh, then that shows that there has been a bit of influence and you have used that influence to ensure that those transactions do take place so if there are material transactions that's usually quite a key one and also if there's some interchange of managerial personnel, uh, if there's interchange of managerial personnel, again, that's demonstrating that you have used your influence uh, to put your key management personnel within that entity. OK, they might not be able to control what happens within that entity, but they can certainly influence it, can't they? So most of the time, if you see between 20 and 50 percent, then yes, that goes through and shows that we have influence. But do just be on the lookout, uh, particularly for non-computational style questions where it asks you to try and decide if you have influence based upon other aspects and you need to commit to memory those four that you have there the representation on the board the participation in the policy making process material transactions between yourself as the investor and the entity and also an interchange of managerial personnel so that goes through there and explains when we have influence okay uh, let's just go on and start thinking about the actual accounting treatment. Uh, 
the key bit about the accounting treatment is that we do not have control, do we? So therefore, it is not consolidated. So we don't add across the assets, the liabilities, the income or the expense of the associates. What we go through and do there is use a process which is referred to as equity accounting. And equity accounting essentially says that we are going to take P's share, so your ownership share of the associates. And what you do there is you have a one line entry. So we don't even put in your share of each individual asset and each individual liability. You put in your share, and we'll see how that works in a moment, of all the assets and all the liabilities. And we also go through there as well as looking at what we have in your position statement. We also look as well what we have within the income statement or your statement of profit or loss. And we put in our share of whatever happens in terms of the profits of the associate. So the key bit to remember there is that we are looking at equity accounting of an associate. And when we refer to as equity accounting, I like to think of it as thinking about our share of whatever happens within the associate. So let's go through and have a look at it with regards to the statement of financial position. Uh, what do we see there? So within the statement of financial position, what you have there is referred to as an investment in associate. Uh, that investment in associate is that one line item that you see in the statement of financial position. And it is shown there within non-current assets. So typically within non-current assets, you will have property, plant and equipment. You will have goodwill and now you will have an investment in associates. That figure is calculated below. As you can see there, you look at the cost of the investment. So essentially we can go through there, can't we? And think about that as what we have paid to get your percentage ownership. But what you then want to go through and look at is looking at the influence that you then have based upon that investment that you have made. And what you have there is influence over the, the profits, isn't it? So as that associate has gone through and traded since you bought it, you have had influence over those profits. So what we're going to go through and do there is we're going to take our share of whatever the post acquisition movement in reserves is. So key bit there, like we said about equity accounting, is that it is all to do with our share. So we take our share of the post acquisition reserves. Other bits that we need to consider as well is maybe since the acquisition, the value of your associate has fallen, that associate reduction in value is referred to as an impairment, isn't it? Like we had with an impairment that you have with regards to your goodwill. Just be very, very, very careful. When you equity account, you take your share, don't we, of the post acquisition reserves of the associate. But when you're looking at the impairment, we don't take our share of the impairment. And the reason why is when that impairment has been calculated for us, it has already taken account of our share of what we own of the associate. So the percentage ownership has already been dealt with. And if we've already dealt with our percentage ownership, then we don't need to make any further adjustments to that impairment. So whatever impairment figure you're given, you adjust for that in full and do not take our share of it. That figure that you've got then at the bottom, uh, that's the figure there that appears within your non-current assets within the statement of financial position. So essentially what you're doing is you are increasing, aren't you, that cost of the investment in the associate by the share of the post acquisition reserves and reducing it by any impairment. So there will be a net increase, won't there, within the associate. So what you need to go through and do that is you need to go through to balance up the statement of financial position. You need to go through there, don't we? And make an equivalent entry in working number five, which looks at the group reserves. Okay, So as you've increased the investment in associate by your share of post acquisition reserves, 
and reduced it by the impairment to date. So remember, in the SFP, everything is cumulative. Uh, you also need to make a corresponding entry in your group reserves because you have increased the non-current assets at the top and you need to go through there and balance it up with a corresponding increase within equity, isn't it? And that's there working five, your group reserves. Uh, then what you have after your statement of financial position is then going through and looking at what we have in the statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income. Uh, so what you've got there is you have, again, one line item. That one line item is referred to as the share of the associate's profit for the year, okay, or share of profit of associates. Where is that one line item shown? It's shown immediately before your profits before tax. So if you go back earlier within the notes to when we began to look at your statement of profit or loss, I think it looks something like that. It may have been, was it in chapter five? Then you can see there all your normal bits and pieces, revenue, cost of sales, gross profit, distribution, admin expenses, finance costs. And then what you have, that single line item for share of profit of associate is what you throw in there with regards to your associate. And that figure that we have there, we will work it based upon our rules for equity accounting. And equity accounting is all about taking our share, isn't it? So here, what we're going to go through and do is we're going to take A's profit for the year. We're going to go through and take our group share of it. And remember what we will go through and do there. Is that we will prorate, won't we? Those profits if it is a mid-year acquisition. Okay. Uh, similarly, when we go through and look at your profit or loss of the associate, what happens if we have other comprehensive income of the associate? Again, nice, simple one line item. You take your share of A's other comprehensive income. Again, if you're going through there and having a look at your group statement of profit or loss and OCI, uh, you can see there that you take your share of other comprehensive income of associate as one line item within your other comprehensive income. Uh, do just be aware that we tend not to prorate that other comprehensive income figure because that other comprehensive income figure usually relates to things such as gains on revaluation within the associate and a gain on revaluation isn't something that accrues over a period of time it happens at a particular point in time so you will go through there and put in that gain in full but then just take our share of it there's no need to prorate the gain there you have it uh, there's a couple of examples that follow on after the adjustments uh, that go through there and have a look at how we go through an equity account for our associates. Enjoy.